Gavin Newsom. We'll find him. Thank you all. I'll wait till everyone gets their seat. Uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome. And thank you all very, very much for taking your time to be here tonight. I think my staff has been all day in the back of the room trying to lay bets on how long this speech will be. Um, and there are long odds uh, that it will be extended beyond the normal term. Of course, I established a much uh, higher bar last year, didn't I? Seven and a half hours. So uh, I obviously have great confidence, and you should have great expectation uh, that we won't exceed last year's 13 different speeches on 13 different topics that accumulated in a uh, seven and a half hour speech. But I'm very grateful you took the time to be here. And uh, as you'll hear in a moment as we begin the speech, uh, that there are a lot of folks on stage that deserve uh, recognition. And we'll be, uh, we'll be recognized tonight for their outstanding example, uh, leadership, uh, for their steadfastness. Uh, and uh, they all are here with a particular meaning and a particular story. Uh, I will begin, though, and I think perhaps it's appropriate here at the Asian, uh, to remind everyone of the old Chinese curse that said, may he live in interesting times. Uh, and these are certainly interesting times by most objective analysis. And I think most of us would agree up until, uh, well, the beginning of last year that most of us hadn't reflected in some time on the 1930s. Uh, we hadn't necessarily thought much about it. It was a fleeting memory. We may have read a little bit about it, reflected a little bit about it uh, in some of our textbooks until, clearly, uh, the mortgage write-down uh, and then the ensuing global financial meltdown. People lost their jobs. People lost their homes. People lost their confidence, uh, not only in themselves, but in their future, but their families' future. And clearly, I speak here tonight, a year later, where there's still a lot of anxiety. And I recognize that. There's still a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And it's right if you feel that way. And I know people at home uh, certainly do. But I chose this location, and I chose the collective people uh, behind me and in this room for a reason. Because uh, this is a special place, the Asian Art Museum. And I think in so many ways, it represents what's good and right in San Francisco. Uh, this museum, remarkable as it is, is the largest museum of its type in the Western world to hold an exclusively Asian collection. It's 6,000 years of history, some 17,000 artifacts and pieces of art, each and every one with a story, each and every one with a story that I believe connects all of us together and certainly connects this city together and connects, as I said, what's right with this city. And I think about what's right with this city when I reflect on its remarkable short 160-year history. Don't forget, 160 years ago, this was a small fishing village, about 20,000 people, until the discovery of gold, where people came from all over the world, hundreds of thousands of people descended upon San Francisco for riches and new beginnings. And it was then, 150 years ago, at the very foundation of this city, that I think our fate and future was set forth. We became one of the most diverse cities then, in this now most diverse region. And I think about reading the paper and reflecting on the nightly news about what's wrong around the rest of the world, where literally nations of people are being torn apart because of racial and religious and ethnic controversies that by definition are fueling fanaticism and fueling terror. And I think about what happened here 160 years ago. And I think about the fact, and I've always believed this, that the world looks to us to see that it's possible to live together, to advance together, and to prosper together across every conceivable difference. There's something magical about the city and county of San Francisco. One of the most diverse cities in the most diverse region, as I said, in the most diverse state, in the world's most diverse democracy. A city that doesn't tolerate its diversity, but struggles and fights hard every single day to celebrate its diversity. We certainly celebrate and recognize all our interesting differences, but at the end of the day, it's the fact that we unite around our common humanity, the things that bind us together, that makes this a special place. This is the city, remember, that had the first Chinatown 
in the United States of America and its largest. In 1860, the first delegation came here to our shores on Ocean Beach. First delegation from Japan. Their ambassador came to the United States, but they came here to San Francisco first. It was President Eisenhower that didn't choose any other city when he called former mayor George Christopher and said it's time for the United States and Japan to establish diplomatic relations. And the way we're going to do that first is to establish the first sister city between our respective countries. And in 1957, that sister city was established in Osaka. We followed up from there in Taipei. We followed up in places like Seoul and Ho Chi Minh City and Manila. We established just recently, as an example, a new sister city in Bangalore and with the government of Karnataka and established a framework of regionalism between not only the city and county of San Francisco, but the San Francisco Bay Area and the broader Bangalore region. And of course, that sister city relationship is going to be celebrated 30 years. It's going to be celebrated this year, that relationship with Shanghai and the city and county of San Francisco. And it's in that spirit and that stead and in that sense of optimism that we decided to open up our first foreign office in San Francisco's recent history. We opened up what we call a China desk in our sister city, Shanghai. And I'm very pleased that the success already of that endeavor, led by Michael Cohen in my office and our economic development team, has paid real dividends. Tonight, I'm very pleased that two people that simply wouldn't be here had it not been for the development and the establishment of that office are about to open up the 10th headquarter company since we established that formal relationship and established that formal office in China. And it's a company called UpSolar. And Troy Dalby and David Chang are here. They're opening up in the Transamerica building. I'm going to start with a handful of employees. And if they're like Yingli, if they're like SunTech, if they're like companies like Sprim, if they're like companies like Trina Solar, they're going to grow. And San Franciscans will be the beneficiary of your commitment and those efforts. I'm proud of that. That establishment made dividends. <laughs> Putting San Franciscans to work. That's why we did it. And by the way, there are five announcements that we'll be making in the subsequent months that I'm looking forward to. But we need, and I think every single one of you recognizes, we need to do more. We need to do better. We not only need to attract businesses, we need to retain businesses. And you saw that example with Levi's. And I always joke, unlike baseball and politics, you don't get credit for saves. But we were very fortunate that we were able to keep Levi's from leaving the city and county of San Francisco. But we had to do things differently. And it's in that spirit that we need to focus on this, the seminal priority of the year, and that's stimulating job growth in the city and county of San Francisco. Now, we didn't wait for a state of the city to do that. Over a year ago, we introduced a local stimulus plan. I don't know many cities that actually introduce local stimulus plans. And I want to just quickly update you on some of those initiatives and the status of those initiatives. Remember the liquidity and credit crisis. We wanted to get money out there that couldn't otherwise be distributed into our community. So we created a revolving loan fund of microloans. We're out there in Noe Valley in Bevan Dufty's district, and we advanced that first revolving loan fund. It was just a few thousand dollars. You'd have think it had made all the difference in the world, and that small little beauty shop was open with that small microloan. $1.8 million was put up in that initiative. We expanded the reach, our outreach, into making sure that companies that were eligible for federal tax breaks, enterprise tax breaks, state tax breaks, we're actually taking advantage of it. We had a concerted effort in our Office of Economic Development, 46 percent increase this year in the number of businesses taking advantage of state and federal tax credits that they were unaware of. We initiated marketing programs like Shop SF and Staycations and started to make a case that we don't just need to market the city overseas or market the city out of state, but we can start marketing the city in our own backyard. And we started to focus on neighborhood revitalization, 
advancing the reach and the investment in our community benefit districts and doing the same with our neighborhood marketplace initiative. And we also did something that I know Supervisor Mercurimi appreciated and Supervisor David Chu, our president, both here this evening. We expanded the reach of our one-stop shops, these career centers. You know, just a few years ago, we had two. Last year, we added an additional two. The year prior, we had placed another two. We now have six of these one-stop shops. And this is a remarkable number. We added it up. In the last nine or so months, 28,267 people, unduplicated, have visited these one-stop shops to get career advice, to update their resume, and to find employment. And speaking of finding employment and reaching out and investing in people in place, we recognize the framework of my comments tonight, we have a very diverse business community and we need to act accordingly and reach out in a culturally competent way. And one of the very specific targets of our economic stimulus was reaching out to Spanish-speaking businesses in San Francisco, working with David Campos and others. We initiated the first of its kind outreach to get specific and, again, provide a framework of support for those businesses. Soon, we'll be doing something I think that's pretty extraordinary. We're waiting for a waiver from the Housing and Urban Development, a $23 million loan fund, taking money that was coming in that was going to go out in the same old traditional way. We're reconstituting it and creating an innovation fund. We're putting $11.5 million in framing the city with an innovation corridor, in the central city down to Mission Bay, the central waterfront, and all the way out to Bayview, Hunters Point, and the shipyard and focusing on those new businesses that are struggling and those businesses that want to get in to this city and provide those loans. This will be happening very soon. In addition to that, another $11.5 million, that 23, that we'll also be putting into the mid-market corridor. I know this is long overdue. We've all been talking. Now, Mayor Brown is here. We have been talking about mid-market for many, many years. Well, you know we've done a lot of interesting things, a lot of pilot programs, and we did the arts in the storefront, and we've got a framework and a plan, but we don't have the resources. And so the framework of this resource distribution, again, is $11.5 million targeted in that mid-market area. It will be part of the Better uh, Market Street initiative. And in about four to six weeks, quote me in only the margins, we're going to be reintroducing a version of the old redevelopment plan in mid-market. It is long overdue to look at tax increment financing and to finally reconcile the fact that we should have been doing this five, ten years ago and finally address substantively the needs of the mid-market. So that's something I'm looking forward to and I hope something that many of you are supportive of. Now, I want, to, I want to be fair here, but I also want to challenge. There are three pieces of legislation that I haven't been able to pass. In fact, I have had a hard time getting them calendared at the Board of Supervisors. And I say this with respect and admiration. We all have different points of view. But I need the Board of Supervisors to immediately calendar these three pieces of legislation. One is a payroll tax exemption on all net new jobs over the next two years. The second one is a tax credit for businesses between 20 employees and 49 that are providing health care for their employees under Healthy San Francisco, and an extension of the extraordinarily successful biotech tax credit that the board wisely passed a number of years ago. Incidentally, we had two biotech companies five years ago. We now have 56. This tax credit is working, and it's making a difference. This needs to be extended. So, so I'm hopeful. You know, there's a gentleman here, and this guy, if you're, you're focused on the industry, you can't miss him. But you're not going to be able, even if you're not focused on the industry, uh, it's going to be impossible to miss him soon. Here's a guy with close to 1,000 employees in San Francisco, Mark Pincus, who's here. He's got a company, online company in the games industry. Social, I don't want to describe it, except to say, Mark came to me some months ago. He said, you know what? We're growing. I'm getting concerned about the growth. And we think we're going to double the number of employees 
But I'm hearing about things not taking shape in terms of those economic incentives. And I've got folks all over the Bay Area that are recruiting me. And guess what? I get to go across the Bay. They don't have a payroll tax. I got a thousand employees and I've got 200. Mark, you said you had 200 open recs. 300 now. He's trying to hire 300 people in this economy. Mark's here because he's concerned. And I hope we consider, and I hope put a face, and I went down to their headquarters, and I'll tell you, this is exactly the kind of workforce you want in your city. A creative workforce, if you've ever seen one. One of the most diverse groups of people I've ever seen. These are the kind of companies we want. Our fate and future are tied to. And that's why these tax incentives are meaningful and purposeful. And every single one of his employees, what do they do down in the dog patch? They go to lunch. They have a drink after dinner. They go to dinner. They live in the city. They respend money. And any amount of money, the modest amount it may cost us in losing revenue on that 1.5%, I assure you, is made up in terms of that stimulating impact that those new employees have. I hope we can keep Zynga in the city and county of San Francisco. And I just want to underscore the importance of getting those initiatives calendared as soon as possible. And to follow up on that, the planning department has legislation. Jen Matz and my team, the mayor's office speaking out, have been working hard on this to stimulate private sector uh, construction industry. And we have some real estate development legislation that is in front of the Planning Commission. Looks like it's got support. We'll see. Look forward to hearing from the public to strengthen it, members of the board. And I hope after it is that we can get that brought in front of the board as soon as possible so we can jumpstart the private construction in this city. Now, as you know, we are not waiting around for these things. And we've done something that I think is really meaningful and extraordinary. It's called a program. It's called Jobs Now. And we believe in jobs now. No other big city has done this. L.A. just found out about it and just starting to do it. And I'll be going up to the governor's office literally tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I've got a meeting because I can't believe that the state of California is not doing something about it. $1.7 billion exists in federal money. Guess how much money has been drawn down in the state of California to subsidize private and public sector jobs, $21 million. This is free money, part of the economic stimulus, $1.7 billion in the state of California, 100 percent wage subsidy. If you pay someone $70,000, we'll take care of it. You pay someone $100,000, we've got someone making $135,000. We will subsidize 100 percent of that. It's too good to be true. And that's why people don't believe it. But I'm very pleased. And as of yesterday, and that's why I'm going to round up, because tomorrow I'm confident we'll meet this number. As of yesterday, we had 1,495 people employed. Tomorrow, I'm sure, we'll have over 1,500 people employed <laughs> under this Jobs Now program. It's extraordinary. And I want to ask, how do, where are you guys? There they are. You guys stand up. If Tammy Matthews can stand up and Nadine Wong and Zinnia Gaines and Tashana Swain and Wanda uh, Thipanya, these are the faces of this Jobs Now program. These are folks that were out of work until Jay Su said, you know what, I want to join this effort. He hired 11 folks on the Jobs Now program, and you guys are living, breathing examples of the success of this program. I just want to thank you for the courage to get back in the workforce and to stand up and to be here. It's an incredible program. The state needs to be doing more of this. Imagine the governor just saw the entire Chamber of Commerce and 150 employers and said, I got one billion dollars, you guys can sit down. I got a billion dollars and I'm going to subsidize all these wages. The only requirement is you've got to have a dependent. That's it. That's the only requirement. There shouldn't be a nonprofit in San Francisco that's not taking advantage of this, not one business person that's not taking advantage of this. Uh, it's an extraordinary program. We recognize, though, you can't just get that job, that the importance of workforce and workforce training is very real. And I'm very proud, and Sophie Maxwell, congratulations. We worked hard on this together for a long time. Our city build program, 380, or excuse me, 358 graduates formal graduates from our academy, but this is remarkable, 1,300 people have been placed through our City Build Academy in over 250 construction projects in San Francisco since we initiated that. So thank you, Supervisor Maxwell. Thank you to the team that's making this real. It's a great success story. It really is.
And by the way, appropriately, that academy is now evolving into a green academy, and we have an environmental services academy. And how appropriate is this, Supervisor? Hazardous waste fo focus, dust mitigation focus. You and I can appreciate that. Air and water uh, monitoring and soil sampling, part of the discipline of the new efforts uh, and focus of the city build program. So when we talk about jobs, we talk a lot at City Hall about the environment. We talk about green collar jobs. We actually are doing it. We're not just reminiscing about a new day somewhere in the future or reflecting on a better tomorrow. Let me tell you exactly what I mean by that. We did something a year and a half ago that was so extraordinary because A, it was difficult to get done, and B, because it just took off, that it became its own worst enemy. And that was a program called Go Solar. You know, San Francisco, as foggy as this city is, is a great city for solar generation. If Berlin could generate more solar than any city in the world on a per capita basis, and let me promise you, you haven't been to Berlin, there has never been a day as beautiful as today in Berlin. Uh, <laughs> then San Francisco can certainly lead the way. So we said the only way to jumpstart solar is take advantage of the tax credits at the federal level and the million solar roof initiative at the state level, but we've got to localize those incentives. And we put together the largest incentive program of its kind in America. The leadership of my friends at the PUC and Ed Harrington working hard to put this together. The Board of Supervisors working hard to make it happen and good work of Supervisor Marr uh, that's been out front supporting solar, and then Bevan Dufty, who came to our rescue at the right time to get this initiative done. Let me tell you what's happened since we started this in July of 2008. 1,141 applications have come in. $9.5 million has been set aside. Four megawatts of solar is up, and we have doubled the number of solar installations in literally a year and a couple of months in San Francisco. And as a consequence, we now are the leader of any large urban city in the state of California in per capita solar generation. Now, here's, that's the good news. Here's the bad news. We're out of money. And I know, Phil Ting, you led a task force on this. You must have been in my office three dozen times saying we need to do more. And it's not good enough to give me an excuse we ran out of money. You've got to find the money. And I said, well, you've got to find me more money as the assessor. And he's working on that. But we got creative. And we are blessed, Steve Kava, my chief of staff, to have a strong relationship with our former controller and now director, Ed Harrington, of our PUC, who was kind enough to agree, with the support of his commission, to formally extending the program with another $5 million into the new fiscal year and doing even better than that. He said, well, we had some backlogs of folks in this current fiscal year, and we're going to put another half a million dollars up targeted low-income solar installations. So thank you, Ed Harrington. Thank you, Phil Ting. Thank you, the Board of Supervisors, for your leadership on this. All those jobs are green-collar jobs. All those jobs are green-collar jobs. They're real, and they're happening, and we're leading the nation in that course and that effort. We have someone, and I, I thought we'd take this time. This is a pretty interesting guy. We finally got a chance. I read about him. He runs a company called Sky Tech Solar. Uh, he's here now. Colin Swan, raise your hand. Colin, this, this is a smart guy. He learned about our incentives, so he said, I've got to do business in San Francisco. And so he's gone out, and he's, he's signed up. He's already signed more. We started. He was at 36 yesterday. He said, no, I'm about 40, 42. He focuses on low-income households, and he provides the solar completely free, and the payback is immediate to people on fixed income. So it's not necessarily an environmental initiative as much as it's an economic imperative for folks to do the right thing. So he came in the city taking advantage of these credits, and then he learned about the Jobs Now program said it's just too good to be true, but I'm going to take advantage of it. And to his left, your right, are two people that were hired to do some of that work and installation and marketing and the rest that are also here. And you guys, if you would stand up, are other examples of our Jobs Now program. Uh, and I appreciate your leadership and you're making a difference. Enlightened businesses. So thank you guys. Now, 
The best is yet to come, Supervisor Marr, because I know this green financing is about as good as it gets. See, there's still the upfront cost of putting in energy efficiency and water conservation and weatherization and putting wind or solar on your roofs. There's still a little bit of cost in most cases. Well, what we're about to do in San Francisco in March is to remove all the upfront costs. This is so extraordinary that I would only put it up there on par with the Too Good to Be Too Jobs Now program. We will finance everything. We put $150 million up in financing, green financing. No other big city in the West Coast has done anything close to this. I want to again thank the Board of Supervisors and Supervisor Mars' leadership, every member of the Board that supported this overwhelmingly. In March, we'll start the distribution of these funds. And we did a little back-of-the-envelope analysis. We estimate that this program alone, and Supervisor, you may not have seen this brand new, I got this today, 1,860 jobs that we believe we can identify just with this one piece of legislation. Thank you. Congratulations. And this is really exciting. I think it deserves a little bit of consideration, a round of applause for San Francisco. Again, a jobs program. I read in, I'll try to be brief, I read in the paper today it said the most aggressive green building standards in America were just passed. And I thought, wait a second, is that a year old, the newspaper? And what a knock because San Francisco a year ago established the most aggressive green building standards in America. And I read the article and it was about the state finally playing catch up. Now it's good, the state's raising the bar. It's still though a lower bar than San Francisco's green building. So much so I had the opportunity to be with uh, a gentleman, and I know Mayor Brown, you may know him, Tony Malkin, he owns the Empire State Building. And he's working with the Clinton Global Initiative, and they're very proud they're going to make the Empire State Building one of the greenest buildings in America. So we invited him out here to learn about what we have already done in San Francisco. See, our iconic building, the West Coast version of the Empire State Building, the Transamerica Building, just reached a new threshold as one of the greenest buildings in the United States, LEED Gold. And you know what it did? It marked the 88th green building in San Francisco. New York, not on an adjusted basis, raw numbers, a modest 76. L.A., eat your heart out, only 56. We lead the nation. Thank you to BOMA. Thank you to all the architects. Thank you for your efforts. This is exciting. All of those jobs, green-collar jobs, every energy upgrade, energy, energy retrofit, Green collar job, five fold increase in one calendar year. 2009, we went from 3.4 million square feet of LEED certified space in the city to 16.8 million in one year. I just want to think about that, one year. So don't let people say this stuff's a little, you know, just fanciful. Uh, it just seems a little theoretical. It's very practical and it's very real. And I'm very proud of those efforts. I want just briefly to let you know we're going to make this year San Francisco the year of energy efficiency and retrofits. Thank you, President Obama and Speaker Pelosi, for all that stimulus money that's coming our way for our power savers and peak energy and energy watch programs. And this is exciting, but only if this is interesting to you. Many of you may go, boy, that really wasn't that exciting. But we are going to convert and this was what, mark my word, this is not just one of those announcements. We have a beginning, middle, and end date. We're going to convert every single public light pole in this city. Those Cobra poles look like this. Every single one of them are going to be converted to LED lights. There's 17,600 of them in the next 18 or so months. Thank you again to the PUC and Ed Harrington and his team and our Department of Environment for leading the charge on that. Finally get that done, which is good. PG&E has to do all the others that are under their jurisdiction, and we also will be challenging PG&E to get to all the rest. By the way, I don't know about you, but I've got to think uh, this was the most, well, this is one of the biggest stories of the year and arguably the decade. Mayor Brown worked hard on this tirelessly. Uh, he was so helpful at getting the Hunters Point power plant shut down. We got to take credit for it uh, because we were there when it officially shut down, but it was a lot of his hard work. Uh, but this one we're going to take credit for. Uh, appropriately, and I say we because so many members of the board were outstanding leaders, in particular Supervisor Maxwell. Again, talk about tenacious in the office over and over again, sometimes very calmly, sometimes very pointedly, saying we need to shut down that other 
most polluting power plant in San Francisco, the Morant plant. Finally, we have a deal to shut down that plant this calendar year. This is a big deal. And so I will only say this. The best green collar job that will be developed this year is the green collar job to tear down that power plant, clean up the toxics and start rebuilding that site. Thank you to everybody who worked so hard on this, and the city attorney, the city attorney's office, and other members of the board, Michaela Alioto up here, who uh, kept us on the right path for a long time. Thank you uh, as well, and all my team in the mayor's office. And, Christine and everybody, thank you for a great job on that. And so when I said tear it down, I mentioned just briefly that we're going to clean it up and then we're going to revitalize it and reconstitute that area. And that goes to the issue of infrastructure. You know, I'm very proud of this. Working with the Board of Supervisors and Supervisor Ellsburn, we established a framework. We didn't do this in the past. We have a 10 year capital plan. It shows, it marks this. This is amazing. Ben Rosenfeld, who's part of that plan, can attest to this. $18.3 billion and a 10-year plan that can retain or generate some 200,000 jobs. And I want to just talk about, and very briefly, some of the infrastructure projects, because I'm not sure everyone has ever put all this stuff together. One of the biggest wins recently was the work that was done in my office and the work, and the baton that was carried by Mayor Brown and his work, and that was finally getting a deal on Treasure Island to develop 6,000 housing units on that island. This is a big deal for our city. And we're going to formalize that in just a few months. That would not have happened without Speaker Pelosi. It would not have happened without the stewardship and leadership of Senator Dianne Feinstein. But it certainly would not have happened without leadership of Michael Cohen and Todd Rufo and the entire team in my office. And something to be proud of, 30,000 construction jobs associated with that, 5,000 permanent jobs. It is a carbon positive, a climate positive development. It will be one of the most sustainable development in the history of the United States when this gets done. The second big project is Hunters Point. We are just months away, finally, on getting the environmental review done in Hunters Point. The voters wisely supported, overwhelmingly rezoning that area for 10,000 housing units, new green R&D space and retail and hotels and the like. Finally going to get that environmental work done. That's another 30,000 jobs and then 10 thousand permanent jobs. I want to thank Reverend Brown and others that have been steadfast in holding our feet to the fire to fulfill the promises of the southeast section. But nothing more important than this, and I see Toy Moses and others out there, and that's this remarkable fact. We have received, Dr. Katz is intimately familiar with this, in just the last few years, six hundred and twenty-five million dollars from the federal government to clean up the toxics in Bayview Hunters Point shipyard. Six hundred and twenty-five million dollars. It's extraordinary. This is a big thing. And that's enough. Thank you again to Speaker Pelosi. It is good to have a speaker in your backyard. It's good to have a former mayor in the Senate. Heck, it's good to have a former mayor that can show up at events that I can't make in Willie Brown. This will not always be the case. And if you're from L.A., I know what you want to think or you're thinking insane. But this is our moment. This is our time. And we're delivering on these promises. $625 million. All those green-collar jobs, right? Cleaning up toxins and so on. And by the way, I, I can't say this because speaker's office is here. They told me I cannot announce next year's contribution. All I can say is it's more money than all the other shipyards in America combined that is going to be invested in cleaning up that shipyard. This is good news. And by the way, we want, and this is something we're working on that we're very excited about. We want, and we rezone the southeast sector of Bayview Hunters Point in the shipyard. We clean up the site, we revitalize it. We want to anchor, and this is something we announced a few months ago, the United Nations. We are the birthplace of the United Nations. So it seems appropriate, just stones throw away from UN Plaza, that the UN would commit to investing in our city, in Bayview Hunters Point, and putting what we refer to as a UN Global Compact Center. This is an environmental think tank and a green tech complex. And we hope this becomes, for Bayview Hunters Point, the shipyard, what UCSF has become for Mission Bay. If we plant that flag, as we did for UCSF in Mission Bay, to anchor the biotech and the life science and the nanotech around the area, we hope 
that the U.N. Global Compact Center does exactly that for green tech in the southeast sector. How appropriate in an area where breast cancer rates, cervical cancer rates, and prostate cancer rates are two to four times the state and federal average, where two of the most polluting power plants in the state of California were residing, and now we're converting it, we're cleaning up, creating jobs and opportunity, and now anchoring a global think tank in terms of the sustainable future, the UN Climate Center. This is real. The announcement was made. Their commitment is made. And one of the reasons I went to Bangalore was to go and visit some of my friends at Cisco to try to get them to invest in putting an innovation center out there. And I'm hopeful, and this is called public leverage, that we'll soon be making an announcement about their commitment to the same. We also have a commitment to start dealing with earthquake preparedness in the city. And I'm going to talk about that just in a moment in the context of the obvious, and it's what happened in Eureka and obviously tragically in Haiti. We have a $652 million proposal that's in front of the Board of Supervisors, and I want to thank the Board almost unanimously has co-signed that investment. The Chief is here, Chief Joanne Hayes White, and understands the importance of upgrading with John Hanley, the Firefighters Union, upgrading our auxiliary water supply system. This was the system, the backup system, that was created after the 1906 earthquake. It is in need of repair. So this bond goes to address that. We also need to deal with the Hall of Justice. God forbid that they move City Hall down to the Hall of Justice and the rest of us are burdened with the realities of the Hall of Justice, one of the most seismically unsafe buildings in the city. We need to move the medical examiner and the crime lab. We need to move Southern Police Station. We need to start that process now. And so I'm hopeful that we will support not just legislatively, but ultimately at the ballot, this uh, significant earthquake preparedness bond. By the way, just those three projects, Treasure Island, Bayview Hunters Point, and the earthquake bond generate 79,700 jobs. Just those three projects, which I think is significant in the next few years. Briefly. What other, I had an engineer in the office the other day said, I, I mean this with sincerity. I'm not trying to suck up and get a job. I already work in the city. I don't know a city in the United States that's doing more on infrastructure than San Francisco. And he started listing some things, and I said, keep going, and I decided tonight to share them. Reminded us of the water system improvement project, $4.6 billion, 28,000 jobs as part of that project. That's the regional water system that we're upgrading. We went through that litany in the central subway. What a big victory. We got the final approval for the final design for a $1.6 billion investment, and we're just a year or so away of drawing down a billion dollars by getting the full funding grant agreement from the federal government to build that 1.7-mile extension, that phase two of the original light rail system, that $658 million project, all the way out into Chinatown. This was a significant thing. Went on to say, what about Doyle Drive and all the wonderful inconveniences we'll have? as we revitalize Doyle Drive, a billion dollar investment. It's happening now. Trans Bay Terminal, the temporary facility opening up this spring. San Francisco, General Hospital, $887.4 million, hundreds and hundreds of jobs under construction. Terminal 2 at the airport, $383 million proposal. A project, 850 jobs attached to that. That will be done in 2011. 525 Golden Gate, one of the most sustainable developed buildings of its type in this country under construction, underway, $190 million, 1,300 jobs. The Exploratorium can invest $200 million down at our waterfront. The cruise ship terminal, Monique Moore's work and efforts and advocacy, invest $60 million and create 650 construction jobs. 50 UN Plaza, $121 million of federal stimulus. They hired Hathaway Dean Witte. They're going to start construction on that project in just a few weeks. And how about our parks? 167 parks and rec facility projects have been complete in the last four, few years. 14 new parks and rec facilities will be done in 2010. We're going to jumpstart and have 17 additional projects that will be underway and complete shortly after that. Our fields campaign is working. If you go to Silver Terrace, you go to Garfield, you go to Quacker Amazon, if you go out and I hope soon enjoy new soccer fields at Beach Chalet or you go down to Franklin Park or South Sunset, you'll see the beneficence of the private sector joining the public sector and that $60 million investment into revitalizing our fields, not just the play fields themselves, but the infrastructure and the lighting around it. This is happening in our city. This is extraordinary. How about the libraries? We're in the former main library here. What city expanded hours in its library system in the middle of its recession in the last year? Only San Francisco. That's pretty extraordinary. No other city. 
13 of them are done. 13 are done in this branch library improvement program. We got 11 to go. Three of them will be inaugurated this next year. Now, David Chu is sitting there saying, but wait a second. I'm not interested in all that. Sure I am. But what about these streets? I'm sick and tired of doing town halls and people complaining about the potholes. It's getting worse. Ironically, Ed Reeskin will acknowledge this, we paved more streets last year than any previous year in memory. Next year we'll pave even more, some 347 projects from 320. But we'll never catch up to deferred maintenance. David Chu knows that, I know that. In fact, let me give you a number. In order to get where we want to go, we need to invest $751 million. This is because 30 years of lack of investment, so we have all this deferred maintenance. It was never a high priority. People, not potholes, you know the routine. We're putting $12 million of general fund on average in the streets. We've quadrupled that. It's over $48 million, but again, it's still not enough. So we have a $751 million need to get our scores where we want them, but guess what? We only have identified $247 million. How's that for a gap? Supervisor and I have been working, and we uh, just did a joint letter, and we're forming a work group in collaboration with the Board of Supervisors, and we've given them a specific mandate to the Director of the Department of Public Works. That in the next 120 days, they're going to tell us how to address this issue. Uh, it is important, and I recognize it is a quality of life issue. It's a basic, fundamental issue that you expect government to address. We're trying to do our best. We know we need to do more, and I look forward to working with the supervisor. And I know Carmen Chu has given me more streets and addresses to repave, and I know it's an important one for her, and, and we're going we're gonna to make progress on that. Final point on the infrastructure, and I'll quickly get to final points here. I thought it was horrific what happened in Eureka, getting all those tweets, watching all those images, until we woke up, or rather, got home, most of us, last night and turned on all the national news shows and found out and are still uncovering what happened in Haiti. It's so horrific, it's beyond description and imagination. Arguably, hundreds of thousands of people injured or have lost their lives. Devastation. And it's right to reflect on that. And it's right to consider what we can do. And soon we will be organizing those thoughts in a meaningful and actionable way. But it's also right to reflect on the reality of Mother Nature's fury out here. And consider the fact we still have hundreds and hundreds of structures on corners with garages above them these soft story buildings that will simply buckle and collapse as they did in the 1989 earthquake unless we retrofit them, these soft stories. The problem is it costs $79,000 to $132,000 to upgrade those. And where's the money going to come from in this economy? So we put together a framework where we were doing voluntary investment. Clearly that hasn't paid dividends. We needed to do that. We needed to process that. But it is high time, and it is my firm commitment to have in front of the board in the next few months mandatory soft story legislation to require every building owner in San Francisco to upgrade those soft story structures. This is a high priority in this new calendar year, as it will be a high priority to help finance the costs associated with these fancy things called Melarus, um, or Cranium Melarus District, or Geo Bond, or reconstituting our unreinforced masonry bond. Don't worry if that confuses you. But we have ideas, we have plans, and we're looking forward to working together to do that. I talk about investing in infrastructure, but there's no more important investment than people, human capital. And that's why the issue of education is always top of mind. And I want to just thank Carlos Garcia, our superintendent of schools, for his incredible leadership and his stewardship. Thank you, Carlos, sincerely. You know, we, uh, we established a partnership for achievement. We've created a framework. We're, we're all getting along. I don't know if you know this, the race to the top money, all this federal money. Do you know San Francisco is the only urban school district in the state of California whose superintendent, whose school board, whose mayor, to the extent it matters, and its union, the teachers' union, have all signed off to support the application and the distribution of those federal funds. No other city 
has done that. This city has done that. Top performing urban school district in the state of California. I know what you're thinking. The bar is low. But the bar is getting higher every single year. The top performing urban school district in California, San Francisco. Well, we can do more and do better. But here's my number one priority into the new year. And that's to focus on the issue of graduation gap, the issue of the achievement gap, or as Carlos Garcia says, opportunity gap. This needs to be our number one priority in the new year. Truancy and dropouts. 32% of African Americans aren't graduating. 20% of Latinos. It's unacceptable. In San Francisco, that's simply unacceptable. Yet we've accepted it, haven't we, for decades and decades. And we lament about it, we talk about it, and we have meetings about it, but we're not doing anything about it. Well, we have a new framework, and we're going to advance a new paradigm this year. We've been having a series of meetings, and now we have specific plans. In fact, next month, we'll be opening up what now we're commonly referring to, and we keep changing the name, a truancy assessment referral center. This is the first time we've done this in San Francisco, at 44 Gulf Street, where folks that are out on the street corners and sidewalks that are breaking the law, these are our kids that should be in school, will be picked up and brought to school. And they'll be engaged. We will create incentives to keep them in school. We will work with merchants so the merchants aren't preying on these kids and spending time with them all day when they should be spending time with their teachers in schools. We have a partnership with JPD, which is Juvenile Probation Department, a partnership, an enlightened one with the police department. There's a new general order going out on this. We have partnerships with our nonprofits on this, and we've got a new framework of data sharing. And to the extent that the data sharing matters, I am now, I had to sign a waiver, a legal document to do this. I started this a couple months ago. I spend my Saturdays, I've done this at least last seven out of ten Saturdays, I think, calling truant kids at home and calling their families. And let me assure you, sometimes it doesn't go over so well. The parents, can be tough. Why are you calling me? What are you saying? I'm a bad parent. I said, I just, I was checking on the kids. But what I've learned is in each and every case, this issue will never be solved by the school district alone. Never. These are kids in crisis and these are families in transition and they need the support of the entire community. And so we have a new framework and I look forward to engaging more on this and talking more about this, but this is our number one education priority into the new year. As is building on success. Universal preschool, only big city in the state of California, universal preschool. 5,695 people enrolled in our universal preschool program. We're going to enhance it this year. More money, not less, in a new fiscal year. And I just wanted to quickly recognize Wendy Shaw is here. I love Wendy. She got frustrated. She had a new beautiful kid who's here, a child uh, named Jocelyn, her daughter. And she wanted to bring her uh, to preschool but didn't know where to bring her because she couldn't find the preschool that she desired, so she decided to create a preschool and open up the first Mandarin Immersion Preschool in San Francisco, the Presidio Knowles School. Uh, Wendy, if you could just stand up, uh, I want to just congratulate you on your example. And also, I want to recognize Emma, who's here, and Noe, and Eli, who's here, wherever you guys are. Thank you for example. And Jocelyn, wherever Josh is. They're all falling asleep. It's bedtime, uh, but I want to just, there's Eli, there's Jocelyn and Emma. Uh, they're just so cute, I had to bring them up to the stage. And these, these kids, thank you guys for your patience. Thank you. Is that for me? That's just a pen. See, already pen in hand, eager to work. <laughs> this one speaks Romanian and how many other languages? Not bad, and four years old. So let me thank you, Wendy, for your example, and thank you guys for your patience in, in coming up. You know, we, we talk about the paradigm pre-K to 12 a lot. San Francisco, our paradigm is pre-K to 16. We believe in higher education. It's not good enough just to graduate from high school. Worked with Roberta Actenberg. She came to me. She said, we have a great idea. We can guarantee everybody a four-year college education. I said, that's impossible. No one will believe it. 
And she came together with folks at San Francisco State, and we worked for about six months, and we put together a program called San Francisco Promise. It's now in six middle schools, and over 1,400 kids are enrolled in San Francisco Promise. And one of our superstars is here, Joseph Stanhope. Joseph Malapai, 14 years old, seventh grader at MLK, lives in the Sunnydale Housing Projects. He's already been to SF State. And he's going around bragging about his college years, and he's just in seventh grade. This is great. It's amazing. I, this guy, watch this guy. I joke with him. I said, "Don't. I'm the future ex-mayor. I may need a job. This guy, I think, is going to be able to hire me. This guy is a superstar. And by the way, I've always believed this. Once a mind is stretched, and his mind is stretched, it never goes back to its original form. That's the power of San Francisco Promise, is the expectation that he has and his mother has about his fate and his future. So thank you, and thank you, Roberta, for your example and all your hard work. And finally, on education, I, you know, we did this a couple years ago. We said we weren't recognizing teachers. Unbelievable. What a simple thing, just to have a thank you and come down. Well, we recognized one of our teachers. We just didn't know what we had on our hands. Valerie Ziegler. Valerie, where are you? Stand up, Valerie. I'm going to talk about you and brag about you. Twelfth grade teacher, Lincoln High School. Teacher of the Month in October of last year. And as soon as she becomes Teacher of the Month in San Francisco, and you say, that's wonderful, well, word comes out that she was nominated for Teacher of the Year in California, and a few days later, she became the first San Franciscan Teacher of the Year in the state of California. <laughs> Valerie, thank you. Well done. So if it's preschool and San Francisco Promise, investment in workforce training, job retention, job strategies, that's all good, but still people fall through the cracks. And that's why we've got to deal with the issue of poverty in all of its forms and manifestation, but none more acute than the issue of homelessness. And mark my words, this is my passion when I got in, and I am more passionate about this than ever, more engaged, more enthusiastic, and more believing in the power of possibility. I don't think we can solve this problem. I know we can solve this problem, and I'm going to share with you some evidence to support that belief. We started a couple years ago with a 10-year plan and chronic homelessness, led by Angela Aliotto, who's here today, and I thank you, Angela, for being here, and I thank you for your leadership. It was a focus, a focus on supportive housing, a focus on housing first, a focus that established a framework that shelter solves sleep, but housing solves homelessness. And we needed to change the paradigm away from managing a problem to solving a problem. We needed to connect the community to the problem. We needed to engage in new innovative models that are drug courts and our mental health courts and establish a new framework of the Community Justice Center and a collaborative court model. We moved forward and started to work on a framework to promise over a 10-year period 3,000 new supportive housing units would be constructed. Never in our history we come close to doing that. I want to mark this day and this occasion and Angela's work and the entire team. 1,633 brand new supportive housing units have been developed and are occupied since we started that program. Hundreds were opened up last year. Hundreds more will be opened up next year and the year after. We will exceed this 10-year goal, and I'm very proud of it. Now, let me put a human face on this. We did something else. We started to do outreach. I always joke with Dariush Kayan, the leader of this effort, that we did in-reach before. We said, you've got to come in, and then we'll do some outreach and lift a hand over the table and try to get you in a program. We actually have 38 people that walk the streets now. One of those people walked up to Melvin Morris. Melvin, where are you? He's somewhere around. There he is, Melvin. Now, now you may recognize Melvin. You may recognize Melvin. If you don't, you're about to. Seven and a half years, he was out in the streets. In March of last year, not that many months ago, one of those homeless outreach workers came and said, can I help you? They actually went out and immediately got him a stabilization room. Another one very high on going to another shelter. Got him a stabilization unit. As Soon as he did that, we started to deal with some of the underlying issues. And I don't want to 
talk too personally, but you shared this and said it was okay. Some substance abuse issues in the past. Just issues you had to address. The drug court model helped turn his life around. Now, recently got engaged in a program through DPH, Department of Public Health, and the library. It's called San Francisco First Power Vocational Program, an internship at the library that became a job offer at the library and became a front page celebrity profile in the San Francisco Chronicle just a few weeks ago. That's why you may recognize him. He is housed. He's no longer homeless. Power of possibility. And you know, he was housed through our Care Not Cash program. 83%, thank you, Melvin, 83% reduction in the caseload. 2,868 people have been housed because we had the courage to change and think differently. 2,868 people have now been housed, like Melvin, since we started Care Not Cash, including Gerald Waldron. And Gerald and I just had a great conversation along with his friend Vince Smith. Let me talk to you briefly about these guys. Both of them now have housing at the Elk Hotel. But Gerald said, Mr. Mayor, this is an interesting moment for me because I didn't like you much. I cursed your name everywhere I went. Care not cash. There's no care there. Just some political slogan. Well, things have changed. He not only made his way in and out at MSC South and finally got on the County Adult Assist Program, but now Gerald is on SSI and his skepticism about Care Not Cash has begun to evolve and Gerald is now no longer homeless. And I'm proud of that and proud of you, Gerald, and thank you for your example. And thank you for your commitment, brother. His partner, his partner, Vince Smith, is here as well. Eight years Vince was out on the streets. Eight years. At a certain point, it's amazing he didn't give up. On and off the County Adult Assistance Program, and in March again of last year as well, he went out there and someone reached out, helped lift him up, got in the Elk Hotel. And I love this. He's now the tenant rep at the Elk Hotel. So he's a leader out there, and I, I want to thank you as well, Vince. Stand up, you guys. Be counted. Gerald, get up. We can solve this. We can solve this. Don't ever believe someone who says we can't solve homelessness. Just wrong. 26% decline in homelessness since we started. 40% decline in the street population. I will not leave, and don't worry, I'm not arguing for a third term. But I will not leave office until we reduce the street population by half and we reduce the overall population by at least a third. And we have marked very specific goals into the new year and I'm absolutely confident by working together we can get there. And when I mean working together, I mean by continuing to support programs like this, Project Homeless Connect. 221 cities in three countries have replicated this model. 22,073 not a duplicated number. 22,000 volunteers have participated in Project Homeless Connect. 300 businesses. Remember a few years ago, businesses were doing full-page ads and billboards attacking City Hall because we couldn't get our act together from their perspective. Now 300 businesses are engaged in participating in our homeless efforts. 250 service providers, dental care, chiropractic care, eye exams, podiatry, voicemail. If you're waiting, you can get a massage got the opportunity to get legal services, state IDs, all kinds of remarkable things happening with this program. And I want to just recognize, is Henry Belton, Henry, you make it? I know he was on his way, but I know Kendra is here. This is a great story, very briefly, guys. Kendra, Kendra, wave, raise your hand. This is amazing. If you go to Brownie, you used to go to Brownie's Hardware, you had to recognize Kendra, because that's where Kendra was living, up on Polk in Sacramento. Five years ago this month, one of those outreach workers, those enthusiastic outreach workers, was at Project Homeless Connect and found Kendra on Turk Street, bought Kendra Drown, and within five hours, we were just talking about this, Kendra had a view of the Bohemian Club and a refrigerator that she had to fill. 
with that stabilization unit, she was able to move towards permanent housing and was so grateful of Project Homeless Connect that she decided to volunteer, worked her way up where she's now part of our senior management team and is a leader in Project Homeless Connect. Kendra Stewardson, thank you. Stand up, say hello. An incredible example. This works. This works. Thank you, Kendra. So we need to take this model and we need to make it permanent. By the way, the next Project Homeless Connect is February 24th. It's our 33rd. If you haven't engaged in it, please engage. Call 311 for information. But please engage with this program. But in the interim, we want to make this permanent. And so one of our pledges and promises that we will fulfill is a 24-hour Homeless Connect in the central city, 24-7, connecting all of these service dots, and we will make sure that a lot more success stories like Kendra are advanced and communicated for years and years to come. Let me quickly go through some things that deserve consideration. You know, poverty doesn't end with just homelessness. We came up with something years ago called the Local Earned Income Tax Credit to allow working families to keep more of what they are, and the only LITC in the United States of America. Draw down some of the Federal Earned Income Tax Credit. 7,821 people in 2008 took advantage of this with the leadership and stewardship of Jose Cisneros. The problem was they didn't have any place to put their money that they were drawing down. So we came up with a program called Bank on San Francisco. Move people from a check cashing mentality to a banking mentality. This is a remarkable stat. 48,209 people are now banked since we started Bank on San Francisco. Half of the African Americans in San Francisco and half of, Asia, of Latinos had no banking relationship before we started. This has become a national model and has been replicated in the state of California, Bank on California. It is an extraordinary success story, and that success has reached a human dimension. And I don't want to just ask briefly, I'll just ask you to stand. Tyrone Hopper and Herman uh, Terencio, where are you guys? These guys are recipients of the largesse and the success of this program. Rebuilding credit, getting out of the check cashing places, saving money, and their lives are back on track. And I want to again just thank the team and thank the leadership of Jose Cisneros on this program. Now, Jose, we came up with this other idea. Found a few dollars, and Jose brought a team together and worked now with 13 credit unions to create something called Payday Plus. One of the biggest problems in this country is the predatory nature of payday loans. Average payday loan, $250. Guess how much you pay back in interest to pay back that $250? The average person pays back $800. You take a $250 loan, 99% of people can't pay them back in the first two weeks when the loans do. So what do they do? They take out another loan. Average person takes out 10 loans. And then it's a cycle. Guess what the interest rates average? You all complaining about the interest rates you have on your credit card? I hear you. But how about this? interest rate. 450 percent, 500 percent. And it's legal. It's outrageous. But we're doing something about it. Payday Plus, first of its kind in the United States of America, a national model that will change people's lives. This is a big idea whose time has come. Thank you to the supervisors for supporting it. Thank you again to the leadership of Jose Cisneros. You mark my word, this will be replicated in cities large and small. Let's take these check cashing places out of businesses. Let's end payday loans in the private sector and bring them in the new sector. Healthy San Francisco, quick update. Can you believe this? Of those that didn't have health insurance, 82.3% of people that didn't have health insurance are now engaged and enrolled in healthy. We're not talking about it. We're doing it. And last I checked, I left City Hall. American flag was flying. It was not replaced with the Canadian flag. This public option works. This is not socialized medicine. And this is a model for the country. And it's something to be very, very proud of. Thank you, Tangerine Brigham. Brigham, thank you for Mitch Katz. Thank you to the board. For all your work. I want to, is Julie McCone here? Did Julie make it? Just, I just want to, Julie, I don't want to ask you to stand up, but Julie said this. I, I was reading, she said this program saved her life. Saved her life. I mean, what do you, how do you respond to that? She, actually, you opened up a small business. Got from the private sector, small business, and you found out health care is not so inexpensive, the insurance. So you didn't have it. You got sick with pneumonia. 
He had a little private insurance before, but got in the private sector, opened up her own business and lost it. You got pneumonia, you went to SF General? I did, and then I relapsed. And, and you relapsed? I went to St. Mary's in May, and I was there for like two weeks. Two weeks? And, um, Seriously sick? Very, very sick. But you learned about this program? Yes, and that's why I went, because I had this program. Signed up for it? Yes, I signed up for it actually in general. But and engaged the sister, Mary Philippa? Yes. Community yes. clinic? And we'll end at that. It's just as good as private health insurance. Thank you, Julie, for being here. And thank you for being one of, one of the 50,000 people with health insurance or health care. I'll just run through this deserves attention. We did something a couple years ago to rebuild public housing in the southeast sector. It's a disgrace. Federal government's a landlord. Go to look at conditions of public housing, even in this city, where we did more under Brown's leadership, Mayor Brown and Speaker Pelosi's uh, good Will than any time in our history, but all the money dried up when Clinton left and Bush got into office. And instead of just rolling over and accepting that, we came up with a local plan. We put $95 million up working together, the Board of Supervisors, $95 million. And now, finally, we're just weeks away from a groundbreaking supervisor, finally, at Huntersview. We're going to take 267 units, convert them to over 750 units, and we have leveraged state and federal dollars in historic ways. And one of the residents that's going to get the benefits of this is Lottie Titus. Lottie, where are you? You're somewhere. There she is. 14 years in Huntersview. Has five grandkids under her custody. Was at Geneva Towers. Was evicted. And just got, you hit the jackpot by ending up in Huntersview. I don't think you thought that the last 14 years. But now she does. She started in our Hope SF Leadership Academy and now has become a facilitator and is really one of our leaders out there. And again, uh, her life is about to dramatically change for the better. I missed out, I missed out on Geneva Towers. You missed out on Geneva, but she's not going to miss out on Hunter's View, and her grandkids will all be the beneficiaries. So this is exciting stuff, groundbreaking in just a few weeks at Hunter's View. And then we're going to get to Sunnydale, we're going to get to Potrero, West Side Courts, and don't forget Alice Griffith. All of these are on cue online. This is going to happen in our city. Five years ago, five years ago, we said we were going to build more housing than any time in the city's history over the next five years. Save Reconstruction 1906. No one thought it was possible, and I almost left, lost my director of housing, Matt Franklin, because he said it can't be done. Don't set yourself up for failure. Well, eat your heart out, Matt, because we just got the new numbers. 10,585 homes have been built in the last four years, 2,025 under construction. And based upon the number of permits, even in this macroeconomic climate, we are going to reach and exceed our goals. But here's the big thing. We have built more affordable housing, 5,268 units of affordable housing than any time in history. And that's in the bank. And that's something we all should be proud of as well. We've done that. So thank you. The entire board, thank you for your funding, for your leadership, and thank you for always pushing us to do more. Community Justice Center, 568 clients. Judge Albers has been an incredible leader with Tamika Moss. You know, this is amazing. You go to the Hall of Justice, 80% chance you're not going to show up when you're supposed to. You go to the Community Justice Center, about an 80% chance, 76% chance you do show up. Lives are being changed. This program is working. This will be a model for others in the future if we have the courage to convince, uh, commit to it. This program, and, I, and before I, this program is so successful that the judge now has two sites. We now have two judges, Judge Georgie, Loretta Georgie, who's going to be down here on Polk Street, and Judge Albers going back to the Hall of Justice just to keep up. And we have someone here, Sheila Keller. Sheila, where are you? Here's Sheila. And, and I want to get too much, but Sheila had a felony drug conviction, three years on probation, got involved with a program called Safe House. In June of 2009, maybe not enthusiastically, but nonetheless, you became an intern. You started working down with Judge Albers down at the Community Justice Center. He was so impressed by you that he reduced your probation. And now everyone is so impressed by you that they were all clamoring to say, get her down here because she needs to be recognized. And I love you said this, said if I could succeed with this, Trust me, anyone should succeed. So, Sheila, thank you for your example 
And thank you for being part of that. Crime, very briefly, our new police chief is doing just a fabulous job. Police Chief Gascon is here. And this is just great news. Listen. Violent crime is down again this year by 10 percent, and Bayview down 13 percent, and the mission, excuse me, in mission down 13 percent, Bayview it dropped 17 percent. Homicides dropped to the lowest level in half a century. They dropped 54 percent this year. In the mission they dropped 75 percent from the previous year, and in Bayview they dropped 42 percent. Clearance rates are moving back to where they should be. We've more than doubled the clearance rates, so we're holding people accountable. We've got a chief who understands the importance of accountability at a whole new level. Supervisor Dufty has been to every single one of these ComStat meetings so he can attest to the success of the ComStat program. Real accountability, real transparency. This is real change using real data and real-time policing. This is very good news for the citizens of San Francisco. As the chief said, when we announce these numbers, over 50 human beings are walking around the streets than would have been had we continued the status quo from the previous years. So I want to thank the Chief, thank all of you on the Board of Supervisors for your leadership and your stewardship. Thank you to the community and all the violence prevention work. Thank you for that effort, and we're going to continue to do even more, I believe, in the subsequent years. But using data is going to be the big change into the new year. And speaking of data, the Muni system is being informed, and the changes at Muni are being informed by data. I should not. I, I, we had a big debate in my office. They said, don't bring up Muni. You can't win. Mayor Brown is not smiling. Because he knows intimately that you cannot win on this topic. So I hesitate to say this. But Muni had a record on-time performance here last year. It did, just the facts. I know. I won't even bring up accidents, but Supervisor Dufty knows this. Pedestrian collisions are down 37.7 percent. Who would believe that? Collisions generally are down 18.4 percent. No one believed that. And overall accidents are down 8 percent. I went down to DeHaro in 17th just a few days ago, and there was just another example. So the stats belie the reality for so many people. Look, your bus doesn't show up. This system is calamitous. But we're improving. We're making a difference. And, you know, we made big service changes on December 5th, all informed by data through this transit effectiveness program and the good work of the controller's office the support of all members of the Board of Supervisors. And we will be making tough choices. We've got a $22 million remaining shortfall, Nat Ford and his team. But they'll be informed by real data, not antidote. And that's the big shift and the big change that gives me confidence that these numbers can continue to get better. And by the way, ridership went up at Muni last year. It went up. Six million more boardings than the previous year. Do you know it went down in almost every other city in the United States? Some 3.8 percent. It went up in San Francisco. And that, to me, is the most important statistic. More people are using it, but we know we need to do better and more. I mentioned the budget. Look, I'm going to spend plenty of time on the budget. I'm not going to burden you tonight with a budget speech. And I recognize this is the number one priority should be in the interim as we build job framework for economic growth and jobs and our recovery, we've got to reconcile our budget. We've made tough choices on our mid-year cuts. We made, I think, appropriate choices, though I know there's still some controversy. But that decisive action has kept our bond ratings high, and it's allowed us some breathing room to address this half a billion dollar shortfall. I won't even begin to reflect on Governor Schwarzenegger's budget. And I want to just leave it at that because I may see him tomorrow. But I'll tell you that we, we were just, we're already at over $200 million in cuts. And we're still adding up. It's just, it cannot happen. So I'm not even going to indulge you anymore on what we're finding in terms of the details of that budget. Suffice it to say, we've got a lot of work. Here's what we're going to do, though we're going to have a series of town hall meetings outside of City Hall. We're going to connect with real people. 
not just folks who spend their time at City Hall. And we're going to have a series of these town halls in February. And I hope people participate, not just everyone is in this room, but folks that are at home that need to participate in the development of this budget. But our focus, and this is my final point, my focus and the focus of this budget must be reform. We cannot tax our way out. I have not met one human being. I just haven't. Maybe tonight someone will come to me and say we're undertaxed in San Francisco. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't support an appropriate tax measure, but we've got to justify it, and we've got to think about who we're impacting and the unintended consequences. Nor can we cut our way out, so we've got to reform our way out. We've got to do things differently. I want to just briefly tell you, because I'm not sure folks know this, the reforms we've already done. Eat your heart out, State of California. Everything they're trying to promote, we have already done in San Francisco. Two-year budgets, we're doing that. And thank you, David Chu, for all your support and leadership on that, and of course, Ben Rosenfeld for his support on that. Three departments will be doing a two-year pilot this year. Five-year financial plans, we are now doing that. Pay as you go, the voters approved a pay-go initiative. A rainy day reserve, we've had it for years. That's why no teachers were laid off last year, capturing all that one-time revenue for one-time uses. We have that. Civil service reform, 36 out of the 45 original recommendations I made have been implemented. Faster hiring times. Performance reviews for the first time in history for every employee in government. We had never done that before. The remaining proposals have all been wrapped up into Civil Service Reform 2, which will be rolled out this year. Mickey Callahan and the Civil Service Commission will address. Overtime is down 20 percent. Workers' comp is down by millions of dollars. We've eliminated four departments and consolidated the back office functions of 23 others. That's where the real savings is. We're working on contracting reform with the president of the board, working with Carmen Chu and others on this. We've reduced our sole source contracts. I remember when Angela Aliotta was running against us for mayor talking about sole source contracts. We have reduced sole source contracts, Angela, which I know you're happy about, even though I'm going to request the board to approve a new one. That's another topic. We're streamlining permitting. DBI is a better department than it was a few years ago, and planning will be a better department in the new year. A lot of reforms John Ram is going to be advancing on permitting. More transparency, open source, open uh, participation, open data. Open data SF is now become an international model. New applications, people designing government in their own image. I won't burden you with this, but this is a big idea that's been recognized across this country. More accountability, San Francisco stat, 311, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, a human being answers the phone in 179 different languages. Tell me you used to get that kind of service in the past with 2,300 telephone numbers. Now we have one. I know the matrix offends the press in this city, but the accountability matrix does not offend me, and we continue to put that out, and that's our own scorecard, our own progress. But the big one is pension. We made a lot of progress working together with labor, and I want to thank them for their example on pension reform a year and a half ago in Supervisor Ellsberg. We started to address unfunded health care liability, and now new employees are starting to pay into that. But the big one is upon us, and I want to challenge everyone to consider just briefly the following facts. Ten years ago, we invested $383.7 million into people's retirement, Social Security, and health insurance for all retired and active employees. Do you know what we pay today? $890 million. That's a 132 percent increase. Guess what? We're projected to pay in 36 months. $1.4 billion. $400 million to $1.4 billion. That's on an annual basis. Where does that money come from? It comes from the Sheriff's Office. It comes from our work in revitalizing our diverse communities. And it's certainly not coming from the state and the federal government. So we've got to own up to this, and we've got to acknowledge this. And we need to advance our pension package through the board and allow the voters to make a determination about that reform this June. And I just want to encourage all of you to consider the same. I want to end just by saying a few things about my feelings about this city and, and wrap up the night. You know, Will Rogers, when in doubt, quote Will Rogers, <laughs> said something I appreciate. He said, even if you're on the right track, and I think in many ways we are, 
You'll get run over if you just sit there. I think that's true. I've always believed, many folks in my office heard me say this, that our destiny is not written for us, but our destiny is written by us. That it's our decisions, not conditions, that determine our fate and future. That a destiny, our destiny in this city, in the past, has been determined always by our resolve. Think about our experiences through earthquakes and fires and recessions and depressions from the gold rush to the dot-com bust. You know, if we can move away from situational values and start advancing more sustainable values, if we can play to our strengths a culture of innovation, a culture of imagination, that wellspring of ingenuity and creativity and that free thinking that defines the best of this city, if we can remind ourselves of all of the good examples, all of the good examples that are here, and the fact that they are worth more than a thousand theories. And if we can remain, most importantly, hard-headed, but at the same time, big-hearted, then I promise you, the best is yet to come. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your time tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, guys.